My name is Brendan Howell. I'm a media artist and an engineer. I live in Berlin, Germany, but I grew up in the States. And uh, my background, I guess, is a little unusual because I studied engineering initially. I did my bachelor in engineering. And as I was getting towards the end of my studies, I was uh, getting a little worried about what I was going to do when I was done. And I was having a hard time getting excited about going to work for a big company. And it seemed like all of the cool things had already been invented. And most of the stuff I was interested in were more of these sort of absurd applications. And so it was a little bit of a, I don't know, a desert period for me a couple of years after that where I had done some art and I'd studied some art in school. But um, yeah, I was sort of figuring, trying to figure out a way to be able to use my skills and my interest in technology, but without necessarily having to um, basically build stuff for somebody else who had applications that maybe I wasn't was morally opposed to or just found them kind of boring. Uh, so I ended up at some point going back and studying some more and getting a master's in fine arts. And so now I feel like, well maybe I, I, like, I make less money, but I found some sort of medium point where I uh, can work with technology and, and survive, but also on the other hand, I've got uh, more of a foot in the, the, the world of culture and art and design and where all these things are sort of overlapping and for me that's where the interesting things are going on. Yeah, I think in the university setting it's sometimes difficult but I definitely try to bring in a lot of theory and conceptual ideas that are that people are in the, the whole media art world are playing with because I think those are mostly what you know where the critical themes are, the things that you need to designers because I'm teaching in a design context so I think designers need to be not just reproducing whatever's hip right now and imitating styles, but they need to, if they want to really be successful or if they just want to be more relevant, they need to actually take apart some of these critical ideas, you know, what, not just to say like, oh, social networking is cool and to go and build a Facebook app, but to actually think about the, the fundamental principles of social networking and how that's changing the way we as a society interact with each other and what our everyday life looks like. I think those themes are interesting and if you want to be a really good interaction designer that's what you're thinking about not just how to make the buttons look nice and shiny and stuff like that. Uh, so that's one thing I think I take from my practice and I bring uh, into the, the classroom. Yeah, I mean honestly I use the term new media art because uh, it's something that people, it's become popular enough that people usually have some vague idea of what that means. Otherwise, it's too difficult to explain. You know, when you meet someone at a party, you have to be able to say um, what you do. And you can't tell them this whole long story. So you need a few short names. And it's, it's a lousy name, it, especially the word new is really problematic. And then media, as if to imply that everyone else who's making art isn't using media, which they are. So it's a, it's a problematic term, but um, I, I just, it's just a practical thing that I use it. But in terms of what the approaches that people are taking, I think there's been, definitely been a big shift. And mostly it's pretty positive that in, especially in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you had a lot of what we think of as new media art and that sort of set a standard, but it was really based on a sort of technological spectacle. Like people wanted to see something reflected about themselves or about society, that it was, uh, you know, we were these powerful, we could make these huge spectacular installations and we could put together these ridiculous budgets and have 10 video projectors and a huge room and some architecture or something like that. And some of those, I don't want to, you know, crap on all of that work. Some of it was really cool and really important, but it, it set a standard that maybe was hard to maintain and um, made it less relevant. And the thing I think that's interesting now is that we're working with materials, at least in my work and a lot of the people that I know, we're working with the materials of everyday life. 
for most people in this modern era, that everybody has a phone, most people have a computer and internet access and all this stuff. And these are the things uh, that everyone uses in their everyday life. And I think that makes the work potentially way more relevant to what's happening in the world today. And that it's not just this sort of uh, spectacular object that's in a white cube, or it's a sort of isolated architectural thing where you go in and you say, wow. It's more of uh, something where it's about this everyday material, so it gives you an in as a viewer to relate to it and say like, oh yeah, this guy's making art out of you know, sort of cheesy web pages or spreadsheets, or he's using cheap computer parts, and uh, it has this sense of, of relevance that I think other media maybe have a harder time getting to. Well, I guess for me personally, uh, this question of, of all this, of how we've suddenly accepted all this stuff and that everyone's using these things every day. We've got phones, we've got internet, we've got, um, you know, everything digitized. We have all this information about ourselves, about other people, about institutions and everything. And um, at some point, I guess what makes me get a bit worried and it's something that seems to be coming out of a lot of these messes in the financial markets that you see going on right now is it has to do with this capacity for abstraction you know and it's something that we it's really useful if you can abstract something then you can deal with it in a way that you couldn't before if you can put it into a box then you can just move the box around you don't have to worry about what's in the box and so it's a useful metaphor but I think at some point it starts to become dangerous because we start to think that we have this infinite uh, potential to understand things but we don't really know what's going on inside the box and so we go to the store and we buy this thing and we build a cool widget out of it and everyone's impressed but then we don't really understand what's going on inside of it because every at least if you look at the some of the German new media studies that came out that they started doing this stuff in the 80s they took a different approach to the other people who are only looking at the sort of social aspects of media. They said, well, let's turn it on its head and let's look at the actual technology and look at what are the, the, the agendas, what's the, the politics of a CPU, you know, what, what was the model of the utopia or the world that these guys had when they put the thing together. And so um, that's one thing that you can try and, and tease out in, in new media art and I think it's it's important and I don't know I mean in some ways it can be a problem though because you end up becoming more like a science teacher than an artist and um, that's not a bad thing but I think if you're calling yourself an artist you still need to have this approach where um, you leave some, something open to interpretation rather than trying to tell people what they need to understand. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that really resolves the issue, but, but that's, for me, where the, the interesting problems are right now is this complexity and then this debate about whether or not, you know, how you present the complexity to uh, an audience. I guess my approach to dealing with complexity, especially if I'm wanting to, uh, you know, to bring the ideas to somebody else, is I guess typically I... I don't want to dumb it down, but what I want to do is reduce the complexity of the system. So I like to do a lot of almost analog experiments that sometimes you make somebody, if you want to teach people about networks, you actually build a network without any electronics and you actually have some sort of signaling system like semaphores where people have flags that they're waving to each other and they have to build a network and then you explain the aspects of network technology and then uh, you have a real network, it's not just a metaphor, it's actually a real network, but you don't have this layering of, of complexity where you have electronics and you have ethernet and then you have TCP, IP, all these different standards that you build on top of it that make people sort of lose the plot or even get bored. That You have something where you've cut it down so that you can explain this fundamental uh, process. and. That's one thing that's important, and I, I find that it's actually some, in some ways more creative, that the people who are doing that, then they start to be inventive themselves and start to actually uh, play it out as opposed to you know, these super technical 
workshops that you can do where somebody explains exactly how to do a particular process with a particular piece of hardware and software. Those can be useful, but once you don't need to do that particular action anymore, then you, you haven't necessarily built up a conceptual background in, in that technology. So I think that's my approach. And then the other approach is to uh, tend to use low-tech technologies, to not get too fancy. Um, and that's always something that, you know, with the spectacle versus the, um, the simplicity, you know, you have to have a hard time with that. But for the most part, I don't have big enough budgets to go spectacular anyway, so I don't worry about it. Uh, so this year for Coded Cultures, I led a workshop called Paranoid Steganography. And um, steganography is the process, uh, it's sort of like cryptography, but with cryptography you write a sort of secret message and it looks like a secret message. You see this sort of cryptic looking uh, set of symbols or something like that. Um, and the idea with steganography is that you hide something in plain sight. So you could take a a piece of paper and write something in invisible ink and then on top of that you write a letter to your mom it talks about the weather or something really banal and you know it, it looks innocent and that's the idea is that you take uh, a cover and you could or you, yeah I mean it could be anything really it could be an image it could be a text it could be a person you could write you know you could tattoo something on somebody's back until they wear clothes and walk through enemy territory and they've got the secret message on them um, so that's steganography, it's the idea of hiding things. And uh, where paranoia comes in is that um, if you say that any uh, innocent message or any innocent uh, cultural object or arrangement of things by people is potentially, it's a, it's a symbol, and any symbol p contains potentially hidden secret messages. So anything, it could be the arrangement of these uh, chairs here or uh, the flyer that you find or a piece of spam email that you get, you could then take a, a paranoid approach and try to decode it even though you're not sure that there's any secret messages in it. And this is something that's actually real. This, was a, this isn't just some sort of crazy artistic exercise. It's um, something that actually happened in the last 10 years that you had uh, the regime in the States, they really wanted to see this vast conspiracy to destroy the United States. And it was tragic what happened. You know, it's not something that I think should be acceptable, but they really wanted to see this conspiracy and there wasn't. Whether it was, it was a few, I don't know, maybe hundred, maybe thousands of guys who did, you know, have these sort of radical, violent ideas, but they were not, they could barely agree on lunch, let alone, you know, form a very complicated conspiracy. But because the, they wanted to see this and they wanted to use that as an argument to go to war in places like Iraq, which had nothing to do with uh, these terrorist attacks, so they, they needed something to glue it together and they were constantly looking for any evidence that would support their preconceived conclusions. And one of these things that they liked was steganography. And this guy, who was kind of a fake in Los Angeles, or uh, sorry, in Las Vegas, he managed to sell these uh, decrypted messages to the US government for something like 30 or 40 million dollars. And it was made up, like he was just making things up. He claimed he could extract these secret messages from Al-Qaeda's videotapes that were being broadcast on Al Jazeera. And he was just making up numbers. But they closed, they canceled hundreds of flights, they closed bridges, they had orange alerts, they had people going on TV and saying everyone needed to, you know, be prepared for attacks. And they never happened because the guy was just making it up. And so this is the, what I think is interesting to see that in, uh, you know, if you look at certain technologies, you can take this sort of paranoid approach where you see the, you're, you're projecting your own images onto it, you're projecting what you want to see onto technology. And uh, that was the frame of the experiments that we did. And so we made our own 
systems for steganography, for encrypting and decrypting messages. So we hid things in images and then emailed them to each other and then decrypted them, or we um, hid things in spam texts. And then we also did some sort of absurdist experiments where we tried to uh, make up conspiracies, where we tried to see that, okay, these are messages here, that these three blonde women standing next to the U-Bahn, that's, that means something. We had to sort of play out a fantasy of what that would mean. These sort of formal experiments are interesting because you realize that these technical systems that we've built up, they're based on these protocols. And every protocol has a, a sort of cultural logic. So if you look at the way routing on the internet works, it's actually based on some ideas that some kind of idealistic, I don't know, hippie-ish guys, some engineers, and most of them were in the States in the 60s that they came up with. And as a result of the, the sort of model that they had in their heads, they made this protocol relatively democratic. I mean, I don't want to idealize it. I'm not one of these people who thinks the internet's going to save human culture or something like that. But um, it definitely had a, a very strong effect. And for the most part, I would say a positive one. But it's something that you can see. And if you look at the way other technical systems are arranged, that you have certain hierarchies of power. So it's tough. Uh, I think for me as an engineer, one really interesting topic is um, the history, basically how we got here, where, how we made these technologies. And there's this sort of emerging field of, of theory, and there's some artists that are working in this area as well, and they call it media archaeology, which sounds kind of weird, and it, it, it essentially started with people looking at formats that were dying. They looked at floppy disks, and they looked at the culture around floppy disks. You know, in the 80s, they would have these copy parties, so before, way before Napster and BitTorrent and all this stuff. There was plenty of, you know, people who were making cassette tape copies for each other. And in the computer culture, the nerds would have these copy parties where they would show up with bags full of disks, and they would all sit there with a couple of computers copying files and copying programs and games and things like that. And, and this is where, but this, the, this format has kind of died. And most people don't even have a floppy drive on their computer anymore. So you can't even look at this stuff anymore. And so it's something that, that became interesting to, to not just look at, okay, we can get nostalgic about you know, this particular computer or that old game system, but also to look at how we've sort of evolved and how the uh, media itself had a, a certain cultural logic at that time. And one thing that's really interesting is to look at some of the more obscure things, the things that died, and to say, well, why, why didn't that work out? And what was the, the logic, you know, why was it successful and then why did it die? And, and maybe what have we lost? You know, because there was something pleasant or fun or exciting about that particular media. And uh, so I, I like looking at that and, and looking at how technology basically helped shape the way we think or it reflected the way society was thinking in a particular historical moment. And I think the artists that are working in that area are doing some pretty interesting work right now. Um, and not, it's not just a retro thing, it's also about yeah, be taking this almost archaeological approach, you know, the same way as digging up old uh, ruins somewhere, and digging up technological history, and, and trying to see what that said about uh, the people that came before us. Yeah, and you have some of the stuff which younger artists are doing, where they're looking back at the things they grew up with as kids, and how the technology's changed so radically since then that that, that culture's gone away, you know, the whole Nintendo thing and the, the way consoles now are, are going away and people are playing more games on their, um, you know, this touchscreen based stuff with the iPad and phones. Um, and so that, that one was more, you could say, accuse them of being a bit nostalgic, but some of it was really, um, it was kind of revealing, you know, because it, it revealed the aesthetic, you know, that it had like a certain look and a certain feeling, and it brought that back, and you could realize that what it was, and how there was this different way of 
of thinking and uh, and it also shows how we see that period now that we see it differently and so you've also got other people who are digging up more obscure stuff things that are a bit older that uh, you know you had people who um, you know Edison was somebody who was seen as this heroic character but he was also uh, kind of a brutal businessman, you know, and he stole a lot of things and then he improved them. And so there were these other people who were working on these ideas who ended up being pushed aside and they didn't have the fame, they didn't make as much money, but they had some interesting, weird ideas. Like Paul De Marinus, he's an artist who um, has dug up a lot of this media archaeological uh, background in order to produce work that references that period and references those uh, technical phenomena that we now kind of take for granted and it's interesting to take a, a sort of an alternative approach to to just uh, rather than just accepting that you know we have these heroes of industry who built the telephone and the phonograph and all this stuff to say that, like well maybe these guys were <laughs> they weren't so uh, they weren't so nice you know they were they had agendas and they had Push, they pushed through certain standards because they put them into power and that's why they are now uh, these major historical characters is because they had the power then and they had the lasting impression but that maybe there were some people who got pushed to the side who did some who had ideas that were um, that maybe we need to dig up and we can resurrect them and use them today and that's people like Paul B. Marinus or Martin Howes. Martin Howes digs up a lot of this old things where he'll look at the... I mean, he's more interested in almost the sort of speculative side where it, it gets... There's an interesting overlap between uh, religious thinking or um, uh, sort of esoteric thinking that, the, that people like Swedenborg, who was uh, you know, the biggest scientist in Sweden, and maybe all of Northern Europe for a while. He eventually went crazy and had these visions and came up with these ideas about um, religion. And he was kind of discredited, but it's interesting to see that he went from having this visionary approach to technology to then being this sort of religious visionary and that maybe those are two sides of the same coin. And that's an interesting, I mean, I don't want to say that that's necessarily the meaning of Martin's work, but that's an interesting direction he's going in.